I recently returned home from a trip to the Holy Land. As can be expected, it was a really powerful experience to set foot on sacred sites that have been part of scriptural history for thousands of years. Of all the sacred places that I saw, one of my most meaningful experiences that I had while on that trip was while visiting a cave. Now, you might be thinking that I'm talking about visiting a cave where Jesus may have been born, or to a cave where the Savior may have been entombed after his death on the cross. Although I went to both of those places, that's not the cave that I'm talking about right now. This cave is across the Kidron Valley, outside the old walls of Jerusalem. It's on the Mount of Olives, across the street from the famous Church of All Nations and the ancient olive trees of the Garden of Gethsemane. Following a little sign with an arrow that says, To the Grotto, I descended some stairs, made a right turn, and entered into a cave with a Latin inscription above its doorway in red that says Gethsemane. Now, as you likely know, the word Gethsemane means oil press. And thanks to some archaeological research which I had read, I knew I was entering a cave where olive oil was processed and pressed from the olive trees in the garden during the time of Christ. I had a profound experience there as my mind's eye took me back to what that cave may have looked like in first century Jerusalem and what may have happened in the very place where I was standing. To give a hint, in that cave on the wall is a painting of Jesus in a red robe with his hands outstretched, gathered together with all his disciples in that cave together praying. While we often imagine Jesus and his disciples out in the olive trees, There is a possibility that they, and even the Savior himself, may have taken shelter and entered into that oil press cave on that sacred and faithful night. How did I learn about this cave? Well, I learned about it from my colleague, BYU Ancient Scripture professor and archaeologist Matthew Gray, who has recently published some of his research findings related to what is known as the Gethsemane Grotto or cave. I'm not sure exactly how that would have been staged, but we now know that, you know, there was an orchard of olive trees and a cave. So were the disciples asleep in the cave, in which case Jesus left the cave to offer his prayer out by the trees or vice versa? Did they, the disciples sit down by the trees when he says, stay here and watch with me? Did he set them by the trees and he went into the cave to be alone for kind of an isolated moment of prayer? Uh, That's possible too. It is possible, and in today's fascinating episode, be prepared to learn about how and why. This is Why Religion. Each year, religion professors at Brigham Young University produce hundreds of publications on subjects related to The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This podcast brings this research into one place to enlighten the everyday seeker of truth. Seek learning, even by study and also by faith. Interviewing the author, we discuss why the study was done, why it matters, and why the professor chooses to be both a scholar and a disciple. This is Why Religion, research to enlighten your mind. Recently, Professor Ryan Sharp sat down with his ancient scripture colleague, Professor Matthew Gray, to discuss Matt's research publication on the Gethsemane Grotto, or cave. In part one, Dr. Gray, who has graduate degrees in archaeology and the history of ancient Judaism, discusses his recent publication on the archaeological research related to the first century Gethsemane Grotto and how an ancient oil press cave facility works. In part two, he will move more towards some reasons why this research matters discussing implications and application. And in part three, he'll get a little bit more personal with us as usual. So here is Professor Ryan Sharp interviewing Professor Matthew Gray on the Gethsemane Grotto. We're here to discuss a a recent chapter that you wrote in an edited volume that was written as a feshrift for one of our colleagues, uh, Dr. Jeff Chadwick. And the volume is called To Explore the Land of Canaan, studies in biblical archaeology uh, in honor of Jeffrey R. Chadwick. So your chapter in there is entitled Olive Processing and Ritual Purity in the Place of the Olive Press, an Archaeological Reconstruction of Jerusalem's First Century 
Gethsemane Grotto. Now, it feels like there's a story behind a title uh, like that. So I'd love to hear how you decided to pursue this project. Sure. Well, as many Latter-day Saints, uh, I've long been fascinated by the story of Gethsemane as found in the New Testament Gospels. And just as a way to set up the context of this conversation and to uh, remind our, all of us of the, uh, the story that we're looking at today, uh, the stories of Gethsemane in the Gospels are found in, in really two main traditions in the synoptic gospels, the gospel of Mark chapter 14, gospel of Matthew chapter 26, and the gospel of Luke chapter 22, we read about how Jesus and his disciples after the last supper, uh, that final Thursday night before the crucifixion of Jesus ended up leaving the city of Jerusalem, going across the Kidron Valley to a site on the West slopes of the Mount of Olives called Gethsemane. And it was at that location, according to the synoptic gospels that the disciples immediately, uh, fell asleep and that Jesus, uh, was in great agony considering during his fate on the cross the coming day. And, uh, and in that agony, he utters a prayer uh, to the Father where he submits his will to the will of the Father, saying, uh, not my will, but, but your will be done. And finally, it's in that setting that Jesus is betrayed and arrested later that night, which brings him then to the trials and ultimately the crucifixion the next day. So that's the story of Jesus in Gethsemane as found in the synoptic gospels, Mark, Matthew, and Luke. And in the gospel of John, we're told a story that's somewhat similar, although with some key details uh, that are different. Uh, in the Gospel of John, chapter 18, we also read about how Jesus and the disciples leave Jerusalem after the Last Supper, go across the Kidron Valley, where John says that they went to a garden. And there at that garden, Jesus was betrayed and arrested and then on, uh, brought onto the trials and crucifixion the next day. So between the uh, four different gospel accounts, the story of Jesus in Gethsemane uh, has long been fascinating to Bible readers generally, and I'd say specifically to Latter-day Saints of the last several decades uh, because of our unique interest in the story of Gethsemane. When I started first going to the Holy Land as, a, as an undergraduate about 20 years ago and studying in Jerusalem, spending time in Jerusalem, visiting the archaeological sites in the area, uh, I found myself fascinated by the site of Gethsemane. Uh, so several times uh, I would visit the, the traditional location of Gethsemane on the west slopes of the Mount of Olives, where today there's a beautiful Franciscan church called the Church of All Nations. Uh, it's a wonderful church that commemorates the stories from the Gospels of Jesus in Gethsemane, his arrest, his betrayal, his agony, and his prayer of submission. Uh, and if you visit the church today, you'll also be able to visit a beautiful orchard of olive trees that many tourists like to uh, uh, see and pray near and read scriptures near. Uh, and I've certainly enjoyed doing that myself. But as I started going to the site 20 years ago, I also noted that across the street, a little bit to the north, was a less visited part of the site, which was a cave or a grotto, a, a, an ancient natural cave that centuries ago was transformed into a pilgrimage shrine where pilgrims of different faith communities could visit and also commemorate these events at Gethsemane, the agony, the prayer, uh, the betrayal, and the arrest. And as I found myself visiting this cave, I uh, realized that I wanted to know more about it. I found myself fascinated by uh, the history of this cave, the, um, the archaeological context of this cave, and, and what the potential association between this cave and the New Testament stories might be. So with that early interest that started developing about 20 years ago, uh, I became more and more interested in the story of this grotto and more and more interested in uh, coming to an understanding of how it operated in antiquity and what its connection to the New Testament story might be. In your article, you mentioned the term Gethsemane means place of the oil press. You then describe what we know about olive pressing in late Hellenistic and early Roman Palestine. Uh, can you just spend a few minutes maybe talking through what you've learned in your research about this? So early on when I started visiting the site, I started reading some of the scholarship and some of the biblical commentaries about the Gethsemane episode in the Gospels. And uh, what I've noticed is that, that for centuries now, uh, New Testament scholars and uh, reader, close readers of the Bible have uh, tried to understand the nature of the site of Gethsemane, primarily based on the details given in the text of the New Testament Gospels. And there are a few details in particular that are very helpful in understanding the nature of the site in the time of Jesus. Uh, and those two details are terms that are used in both the Synoptic Gospels and John. The Synoptic Gospels use the term Gethsemane, 
And uh, as we know from both Hebrew and Aramaic, the word Gethsemane, it's a two-part word that literally means the oil press. Uh, the first part of the word, uh, got, means to press or to crush. And the second part of the word, shemen, means oil. And so put together, got shemen or Gethsemane in Greek, uh, is literally the place of the oil press. When John describes this location, he does not use that term, but he does say that there was a kepos, which is the Greek term for a cultivated tract of land. In English, it's often translated as simply a garden. And so together, between the synoptic and Johannine uh, accounts, we have this sense that this location that Jesus went to after his Last Supper was a cultivated tract of land, some kind of agricultural facility that had to do with the pressing of olives for the production of olive oil. Those details gave us a sense that Jesus went to an agricultural facility that was centered around olive oil production, and that that's where he spent that last night, and that was the location of his betrayal and arrest. And what's fascinating about that modest reconstruction, just based on the literary clues, is that today, in the early 21st century, uh, we've now had over a century worth of archaeological excavations in the region and in those excavations, we have found dozens and dozens of olive press installations, these oil press facilities that seem to be the exact type of agricultural processing facility that the Gospels are describing. Based on those archaeological excavations, the uh, the Camparanda, the other examples of excavated oil press facilities from Roman Palestine, we have a pretty good sense of how these facilities were structured, how they operated, and how they would have looked. Uh, and that basic idea allows us to fill in how we envision the scene as described in the Gospels. Based on the excavation of olive presses throughout Hellenistic and early Roman Palestine, uh, we know that these olive press facilities were often connected, of course, with orchards of olive trees, where in the fall, workers would go to the olive trees which are usually on terraced hillsides uh, out in the open, and they would first harvest the olives. So they'd pluck the olives, they'd fill up these baskets from the trees. But then we know from these excavations that they would often then bring the baskets of olives from the orchard and down into a cave or a repurposed grotto uh, where the process of actually extracting the olive oil would occur. And the reason why the olive oil extraction process was often done in a cave or or a natural cave or a, a, a man-made structure of some kind, depending on the availability of a cave, uh, is because the olive oil itself needs a place to be stored with some climate control. Uh, it's just way too hot in the day and too chilly at night with that temperature fluctuation that can really wreak havoc on your olive oil production. And so to actually produce the olive oil, it's usually best to have the, the implements of production within some kind of indoor setting, either a natural cave or a man-made structure. And so based on the dozens of uh, olive press facilities that we've excavated in the last century, uh, these indoor facilities are, are pretty consistent. And we can even give you a pretty consistent profile of the features that would have existed in a cave or an indoor structure like that. Uh, let me give a few examples of some of those implements. Uh, well, first of all, you would have a massive crushing basin. So when you, the workers would bring the baskets of olives down into the cave, the first thing they would do is pour the olives into a, a circular stone basin, usually made of limestone or whatever the local bedrock is. And the basin itself would have a vertical beam connecting it to the roof, and then a horizontal beam to the vertical beam that would allow either manpower or animal power to wheel a crushing stone around and around within that circular basin. And the weight of that crushing stone that was being circled around and around would crush the olives into a mash. The workers would then take the mash and put them into thin baskets called frails. And these very thin baskets would then be transported over to another implement within the grotto, which is the actual Gethsemane or the actual oil press. And these presses, at least in the time of Jesus around the first century, were designed in a way that you'd have a large beam anchored into the wall of the cave with a niche. And coming out from the niche would be this large beam. Underneath the beam, you would stack the, the frails, these small baskets of olive mash. And then by applying pressure based on stone weights, the beam would then be lowered down and start exerting a massive amount of pressure onto the uh, the baskets with the olive mash, causing the baskets to open up and uh, their pores to open up, and the oil would ooze out the side of these baskets down into a collecting basin below. And that would be the way that you'd extract the oil from 
the uh, the olives, starting with that crushing basin and then finally processing it in the olive press or the Gethsemane, this beam press uh, extending from the wall. And then finally, what the workers would do is once that oil had been extracted from the baskets, then they would go into the receptacle and scoop up all the freshly produced oil. They'd scoop it into storage jars, line up the storage jars in a storage room somewhere in the cave, and that's where they would keep that product until it was needed for distribution so we know from other archaeological excavation that this is how the process of olive production occurred in Roman Palestine. Based on the names that are found in the Gospels, uh, the name of Gethsemane, or oil press, used in the synoptics, or the kepos, or the cultivated agricultural land mentioned in John, we had a, have a pretty good sense that this is how the site of Gethsemane actually functioned, especially as informed by archaeological comparanda or other examples of these sites found elsewhere in the country. So first of all, you did an impressive job of helping us to visualize what you were just describing there, but I, I wanted to make a note to our listeners that uh, we will also have images of, of what Dr. Gray just described to us available so that you can see it, preferably not while you're driving, um, but you can see some of these images that that capture uh, what he was talking about. So against that backdrop, let's dive into the focus of your article, which is on this specific site that you refer to as the Gethsemane Grotto. You start out by talking about some of the 19th and early 20th century observations of this grotto. Uh, what did you find as you looked through the literature there? So what I found is that starting in the late 19th century, as Western explorers and clergymen and early archaeologists came to the area uh, looking for connections between what they were finding in the land and the stories that they'd been reading in the Bible, uh, that those explorers and, and Western scholars who came to Jerusalem and visited the site of Gethsemane themselves had this interest of how does the landscape and how does the do the surviving features, how do they connect with the stories of Jesus in Gethsemane as read in the Gospels? And so even at, though at that point, this grotto had long since been a pilgrimage chapel, meaning that uh, there was no chance of, of excavating it at that time. Uh, pilgrims were coming in and out of there to worship. It was a holy site by this point. Uh, but still, early scholars, early thinkers uh, were trying to you know, speculate on the connections between this grotto and the stories that they were reading in the New Testament. And so early on, by the late 19th and early 20th century, scholars were already suspecting that the name Gethsemane and the description of Jesus going to an agricultural facility uh, probably had to do with the olive production that we just described. And so the, the connections that I'm already making broadly were connections that were made by the early 20th century. But it wasn't until the mid 20th century that archaeological excavations were allowed to clarify the speculations that scholars had made previously. The story of the excavation of this grotto actually started in 1955, which is uh, a year that the, uh, there's some flooding in the area had actually flooded the chapel, uh, and thus rendering it unusable for a period of time. The Franciscan uh, community who owns this chapel and who operates this chapel decided that the flooding would be a good opportunity to provide renovations to the chapel within the cave, uh, which had not been renovated really significantly since the medieval period. They brought in a young Franciscan archaeologist named Father Virgilio Corbo. And in the uh, early part of 1956, the, the year after the flooding, uh, Father Corbo ended up excavating the entire cave, right? So to prepare for the renovations that the flooding allowed for, they decided to excavate the cave. Corbo came in, pulled up the floors, and that allowed an unprecedented look uh, at the history of the grotto as had been used for the last 2,000 years. How the cave had been used as a Byzantine Christian pilgrimage chapel, how in the early Islamic period uh, it had been turned into a cemetery, basically. Tombs had been sunk into the Byzantine mosaic floors. Then how in the medieval period, uh, once again, turned back into a Christian chapel. New stone flooring was laid. The ceilings were painted uh, with kind of a night starry sky scene to remember the story of Jesus in Gethsemane. Uh, and it was that medieval chapel that continued all the way until the flooding in 1955. Uh, and so, so Corbo was able through his excavations to understand the history of this site. But for our purposes here, what I found most uh, interesting and important about his excavations was that as he was able to excavate under the floor for the first time, he he also found traces of features that belong to this cave during the first century, which of course then allows us to start understanding the nature and the features and the function of this location during the time of the New Testament stories. 
because to this point, it was primarily focused on the purposes of the pilgrimage and helping them to have an experience as they came to the site. Is that right? Exactly, which it had been since the fourth century, right, all the way up until the time of Corbo's excavation in 1956. It was those excavations that really allowed us for the first time to uh, assess this site in terms of its first century context. A couple of years after the excavation, uh, of course, the chapel was renovated and it became into the form that we now would visit today if you visit the Holy Land. Uh, But Corbo, a few years after the excavation, published his excavation reports in Italian. Uh, It wasn't the uh, most comprehensive excavation report that you've ever seen, and it's a little difficult to slog through the the technicalities of it, especially since it was only published in Italian and not in English. But the value of his excavation report is that allows us today— to go back through what he found, uh, features that we will probably never see again, uh, because with the renovations, most of these findings were covered up with the modern floor and some of the modern chapel features. But based on Corbo's excavation reports, we're able now to go back and assess what he found. Uh, We realized that when Corbo excavated this Gethsemane Grotto, uh, he found some really important things from the first century. Uh, He didn't know how to process all of them because uh, the archaeology of of oil press facilities was still very early on uh, in this in this time period. But 70 years later, we're able now to look back on his excavation reports and really refine his conclusions and offer a modest reconstruction of how this facility functioned in the time of the New Testament stories. Can I ask a a quick follow-up question? Maybe two quick follow-up questions. Uh, Number one, is there a sense that that he or others at the time knew of this kind of once-in-a-lifetime opportunity that they had to do the excavation. Did they understand that this was kind of a rare moment? They did, yeah. And so Corbo knew that the moment he lifted up the floor, excavated it, he had to document it as carefully as he could. And the moment he was done with those excavations, he knew that a modern flooring was then going to be put on top of what he had excavated, uh, and that this would probably be the only chance within a century or at least a lifetime uh, to have access to that material. So he was definitely aware of that. Sadly, though, in the 1950s, the nature of excavation reports were not as exhaustive, as comprehensive, and as detailed as they would be today. So even though Corbo had a sense that this was a a once-in-a-lifetime chance, uh, sadly his excavation reports uh, didn't quite give us full enough of a picture that that we have a full understanding of what he found. But nevertheless, uh, we're we're thankful for what we do have. Yeah, so so maybe talk through with us what are some of the things that that he found and and any additional insights that you gained going through those reports. Sure. So yeah, once you go back through Corbo's excavation reports of the Gethsemane Grotto, uh, it allows us to reconstruct several features that existed there in the first century as part of this. Uh, oil production facility called Gethsemane. Uh, So just to kind of start a tour, then I'll try my best to verbally describe each one of these features, since I know that, uh, as you said, many people are probably driving and don't have access to the visuals contained in the article. But basically what Corbo found is that this grotto was a natural limestone cave that sometime around the first century had been repurposed into an agricultural facility that contained the following features. Uh, First, it had a natural opening that face north. So it's the site's on the west slope of the Mount of Olives, but this cave is oriented slightly to the north. So it actually has a natural opening facing north, and the natural opening uh, was about 16 feet wide. Okay, that gives you just a sense of how, how large the natural opening of this grotto was. And once you were to enter this grotto from the north, so now you're facing southward, uh, you're now entering an interior space within the natural grotto that is roughly 60 by 36 feet in dimensions, right? So you can get a sense of, it's a pretty significant cave. It's a pretty good size. And that within this cave, there seems to have been three natural bedrock pillars that supported the, uh, the the natural bedrock ceiling. So that just gives you a sense of the, the natural layout of this grotto. But what uh, Corbo had discovered was that sometime around the first century, this natural cave was then repurposed into an agricultural facility for olive pressing. And the evidence that he found as I said, some of which he understood and identified correctly, and some of which he didn't quite understand because archaeological excavations of these facilities hadn't quite matured yet. But in any case, let's continue on our tour then of the grotto, pointing out what he found and what we now think it means. So one of the features that Corbo found but probably did not understand uh, what it was, was the low part 
of some outcropping of rock on the floor that he wondered if it was part of a, of a fourth natural pillar that somehow had been had been cut back. And so in Corbo's reports, he talks about how when you would first enter the cave just on your left or on the east side, uh, there might have been a pillar that once existed there but that no longer survives. Uh, and this is one of the features that I think we can refine from Corbo's understanding because now that we know how these oil press facilities worked, we know that somewhere within this grotto had to be the crushing basin, that first step in olive oil production. And since Corbo didn't find any obvious traces of this uh, crushing basin, we now, looking back, have to figure out it has to be somewhere. Uh, and probably what happened over the centuries, pilgrims probably chipped away at most of it, so most of it probably just does not survive. But one of the suggestions I make in my article is that that low piece of rock that Corbo had found that is now no longer visible, it's now under the modern floor, that rather than being the base of a pillar that once existed there, as Corbo had suggested, uh, I made the suggestion that that actually represents the base of the ancient crushing basin, just with the rest of the basin having been removed in antiquity, probably chiseled away by pilgrims or something like that. And so even though I can't prove that, uh, the the piece of rock that survives under the floor today uh, matches very well with the bases of crushing basins that we know from other oil press facilities. So I, I feel reasonably comfortable identifying the location of the crushing basin, which would have been right inside that natural entrance, a little bit to the left. But again, it's uh, not visible today because of the uh, the modern flooring. But that's one feature that Corbo found that I think we can now uh, identify. The next feature that he found that uh, he was most excited about exists a little bit further to the east of the grotto. So again, if you were to go in through the natural entrance, turn left, which is now you're facing east, you'll notice in the east part of the grotto is an artificial niche. Uh, in other words, a part of the cave that was artificially expanded out to create room for some kind of implements. And it was in that uh, that niche to the east, where today, by the way, you'll see the modern altar area. So if you go into the chapel today and you look to your left, you'll see the uh, the modern table and there's a modern painting of Jesus. Uh, it's in that modern altar area that Corbo found the uh, one really important feature that allowed him to identify this as a first century oil press facility. And that is he found the niche in the south wall that would have been used to anchor the beam that was part of the original oil press or the original Gethsemane. So even though the other parts of that press itself, the press implement, uh, again, were destroyed in antiquity. They did not survive from the first century. Much of it would have just disintegrated if the perishable items of the wood and the ropes, but the other, you know, the large stone weights and so forth were probably just chipped away by pilgrims. But the one surviving trace of the actual beam press was the niche that Corbo found in the south part of the wall. Today, it's covered up with a little curtain, but if you see the altar area, look onto the south part of that altar area, see that little curtain in the wall, Right behind it is the niche that Corbo found, which was almost certainly the point where the beam was anchored into the wall. And so that gives us a, an opportunity to then reconstruct the location, not only of the crushing basin, which we mentioned before, but now the second step of olive production in the facility, which would have been the beam press coming out from that south wall. And we can then imagine the pressing of the olives, the pressing of those baskets occurring in what is now the altar area. Did, did he identify it as such, or what did he note in his excavation report? He did, yeah. So this was one feature that he he identified he was very excited about, and I think uh, is still correct, right? Uh, because Corbo, coming into the excavations, knew the speculations of the earlier you know, 19th and early 20th century scholars that, that this was probably an oil press facility. So Corbo very much went in to his excavations in 1956 with his eyes on that, right? Wondering, you know, are, am I going to find any traces of oil production in the first century? And when he found that niche in the wall, it was the same dimensions, it was right at the same height, and it had some of the same uh, features that uh, that known oil presses also had. Uh, so he was able to draw on the comparisons that he was aware of to say, I, I think this is where the beam was anchored into the wall. And, and today, 70 years later, uh, I think that's an interpretation that holds up. There are a few other features that uh, that Corbo found in his excavations that I think we can comment on as well. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, after the olives would have been crushed in the basin and pressed in the Gethsemane or pressed in the bean press, uh, the next thing, of course, you'd have to do is you'd have to store the olive oil that was produced. And looking back in Corbo's excavation reports, it's fascinating to note that as he was excavating on the south side of the grotto, uh, what he thought was a natural part of the wall ended up collapsing. And he realized that, in fact, it was an 
artificial wall. And that once that artificial wall had collapsed, it opened up a storage space that extended to the south of the grotto. And what he noticed was uh, that, that the storage space had been filled with uh, with wash and pottery. Unfortunately, he didn't publish the pottery, but uh, all sorts of wash that had flooded in. And then at some point in antiquity, someone just built an artificial wall to block off that storage space and plastered it up. And no one knew about it until uh, Corbo accidentally stumbled across this storage room in his 1956 excavations. Uh, now, at the time, in 1956, Corbo really did not know what to make of this storage room. Uh, as I said, there hadn't been a, a lot of oil press facilities excavated to this point. There'd been enough to get a general sense of it, but but not enough to get a full archaeological profile. And so Corbo really didn't know what to make of this storage space. He had offered a few suggestions on what the space could have been, uh, but he personally did not connect that storage space to the Gethsemane Grotto itself in any meaningful way, at least in terms of first century olive oil production. But this is another one of those features that looking back in light of uh, the more recent excavations of these facilities, we can now say, I think with relative confidence, that what Corbeau found was the first century storage space of of the, of the Gethsemane, uh, especially because the floor of this storage room, uh, Corbeau noted, sloped a little bit to the south, and that it contained what he says in Italian are uh, patterns of ridges and dimples. And he didn't know what to make of these patterns of ridges and dimples. But today, in light of more recent excavations, we now know that these storage rooms connected with oil press facilities often were slanted and had rows of depressions in the floor because this would be how they would store the olive uh, or store the olive oil in storage jars. They'd literally, you know, fill up these storage jars with olive oil, and then they would place them in these rows with these depressions with a slightly slanted floor in case any of the oil spilled out or in any case, in case any of the storage jars themselves broke. You wanted to maximize your oil production. You didn't want to lose that oil. And so the, the rows of ridges and dimples or the rows of depressions and the slightly slanted floor allows uh, any spilled oil to be collected in the back part of the room to therefore save as much of your production as, as you possibly could. And so, so that's a feature that Corbo did not know about in 1956, but to, today we have several archaeological comparisons that allow us to, I think, refine Corbo's uh, discovery there. And so I think it's pretty reasonable to suggest that the storage space that's in the back part of the cave probably does date back to the first century. That's probably where they would have stored uh, the oil in these rows of storage jars. And then finally, the last feature that Corbo discovered that, uh, again, he didn't fully know what to, what to make of, he didn't fully understand how to interpret it, was he noticed that when he had excavated the entrance of the grotto, right? remember going back to that 16-foot natural opening of the cave in the, on the north side, he noticed that uh, from the outside of that natural entrance, there were steps carved into the bedrock that led down into a plastered uh, what he thought was a cistern, right? So some kind of plastered reservoir for the uh, storage of, of water. And so when he cleared out that reservoir, uh, he identified it in his excavation reports as a cistern, uh, maybe used to collect water from, uh, uh, well, collect water for the washing of olives, perhaps. He didn't fully understand how a cistern would relate to the olive oil production. Uh, but with that report that he had found a cistern on the northwest part of the grotto, uh, that had been the interpretation for a very long time. Uh, but one of the uh, fun aspects of the project that I was able to work on, by going back in light of what we now know, uh, it now seems clear that what Corbeau found in that water system that's underground, underneath the flooring of the chapel, or underneath the flooring of the, the cave, uh, is not in fact a water cistern, but is a stepped pool called a mikvah. It's a Jewish ritual bath that uh, allowed workers who were harvesting these olives to harvest and process the olive oil uh, in a state of ritual purity. And this is something that uh, uh, most people were not attuned to in the 1950s. Most of the time when you found a plastered water feature in the 1950s in an excavation, you just identify it as a cistern for simply storing water. But today we now know that certain features like the types of steps that Corbo described, the type of uh, uh, layout of this particular feature are actually very common in these ritual baths called mikvah oat. And so in light of these more recent archaeological discoveries, we're now more aware than Corbo was in the 1950s that agricultural workers working at a facility like this needed to be in a state of ritual purity and, and therefore needed to have easy access to 
a ritual immersion bath like this. And so uh, this is another one of those features that even though Corbo didn't fully understand uh, that he discovered for us and that we're now able to look back and recognize what it probably was, which was a mikvah. We now know that that type of water facility uh, existed throughout the country. And so again, through comparing it with more recent archaeological excavations, I think we have a pretty decent reconstruction now of how this facility worked with its natural opening, its crushing basin, its uh, olive press, its storage uh, facility, and then of course its ritual immersion pool to allow the olive oil to be produced in a state of ritual purity. One of the fun things about this particular article is being able to highlight what he did find, uh, reassess them in light of more recent discoveries, and then offer a refined reconstruction of this location that hopefully will better inform our understanding of how the site worked, how it related to the New Testament Gospels, and so forth. And so with that modest reconstruction, then, I think that we can also better integrate what Corbo found into larger academic conversations. And I'll, I'll just give you a few quick examples of, of that. Uh, number one, this idea of Corbo finding a water feature that we can now identify as a cistern can now contribute to more recent conversations about the need for workers to maintain ritual purity while they're producing olive oil. That's a conversation that's really only about 10 to 15 years old. And that a reassessment of Corbo's findings in light of him finding a mikvah connected with this facility uh, now provides additional evidence for that ritual purity practice in an oil press facility in a way that previous scholarship hadn't acknowledged. So I think that's really important. Uh, and I think it's also important because it does allow us now, I think, to refine our understanding of how uh, the site would have worked in the time of the New Testament. So if you're going as a pilgrim or as a New Testament scholar, being able to look at the archaeological reassessment of this site, uh, I think better allows us to envision uh, kind of the layout of this uh, of this location in the first century. So for example, uh, in light of the surrounding features, we know that just to the south of this grotto is the ancient Roman road. Uh, further to the south of that are ancient tombs, and further to the north of that are ancient tombs. But what we notice is just to the northeast of this grotto would have been the terraced orchard of olive trees uh, that probably comprised the garden that John was talking about, or the actual orchard of olive trees that would have produced the olives uh, for the Gethsemane to process. So if we envision the site, just to the northeast of the site, we have the terraced orchard of olive trees, which today would work itself up to uh, the area that is now known as the Orson Hyde Gardens. I know a lot of modern Latter-day Saint tourists like to visit the Orson Hyde Gardens. Well, when you're on the south side of that Orson Hyde Garden area, uh, that probably was the orchard of olive trees that was connected to uh, this particular facility. And then, of course, the facility itself with its various implements and its uh, ritual bath all of which allows us to just better understand the landscape of the Mount of Olives at the time of the New Testament, which I think will help us to read the New Testament stories better. If you're interested in more peer-reviewed, high-quality research related to the restored gospel, BYU's Religious Studies Center is a great place for you to check out. I want to bring your attention to their most recent book publication by Dr. Kent Jackson, titled, Understanding Joseph Smith's Translation of the Bible. Kent Jackson, an emeritus professor of ancient scripture at BYU, is one of the leading experts on the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible. In this new book, Jackson explores a central question, how Joseph Smith arrived at its text. For the most part, we have good enough evidence to reconstruct the mechanical process by which Joseph Smith created his Bible revision. That is, the way he dictated the text and the way his scribes wrote it to create what is written on the existing manuscript pages. But behind the physical artifact, what were the means by which he came to the words that would become the new translation? Did they come from his own experience, from assumptions he made while reading the Bible, or from other sources? Or did some or all the texts come through revelation, as he and his followers believed? What were the instincts that guided his work, and how did he translate those instincts into words? This book cannot answer the theological questions, but it can assess the evidence in the primary documents in an effort to understand how the new translation came to be. Again, the book is called Understanding Joseph Smith's Translation of the Bible by Kent Jackson. Check it out and pick it up at rsc.byu.edu.
We've been listening to Ryan Sharp interview Matthew Gray about his recent publication on the Gethsemane Grotto. In part two of Our Religion, we like to get into why this research matters. How can it help us in better understanding scriptures or teachings of the restored gospel? In this segment, Professor Gray discusses how this grotto site provides possible ways to envision Jesus' prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, along with insights into first century Jewish life, pilgrimages, and practices. At the very least, the discovery of this grotto and its architectural or archaeological features uh, can allow, allow us to better envision the larger dynamics of the setting of the Gethsemane story. There was an orchard, there was a cave, and somehow these two features played together in the story of Jesus's prayer, his betrayal, and his arrest. And I think that allows for not only a more careful reading of the text, but a clearer visual idea of how the stories might have played out. And and you had mentioned at one point in one of our conversations when you were giddy showing all of these findings <laughs> in the hallway, um, and, and I want to make sure that I, I capture this right, but you also mentioned that maybe this helps us understand why the disciples fell asleep, because am I correct in, in assuming this would have been a place where often during um, non-harvest season they, they might have slept? Yeah, exactly. So that's another implication that I think is really worth noting here. Uh, it does raise the question of why would Jesus and the disciples retire to this location in the middle of the night after their last supper uh, meal that they would have had together? And... Uh, I think that what this archaeological reconstruction allows us to consider is the possibility that that pilgrims coming to Jerusalem from other regions like Galilee, which is where Jesus and the disciples were from, these pilgrims coming to Jerusalem to celebrate festivals like the Passover or the Feast of Tabernacles or other festivals, uh, they needed a place to stay. Uh, the ancient sources talk about how the masses of pilgrims flooded the city of Jerusalem on these occasions, uh, which raises the question of where would these pilgrims have lodged for the night? And so the fact that after their last supper, all four gospels describe Jesus and the disciples going across the Kidron Valley, leaving this, the walls of the city, going across the Kidron Valley, and going to this site called Gethsemane or this garden where instantly the disciples all fall asleep raises a very strong possibility that this grotto could have served for temporary pilgrimage accommodation when the oil implements themselves lay dormant. Remember, the, the harvest activities only would have occurred in the fall. So a story like Jesus and the disciples coming to Jerusalem during the spring festival of the Passover kind of raises the interesting possibility that maybe this was their hotel for the night. This is mm. their their Airbnb. This is where they uh, <laughs> went after they had that last supper, immediately, naturally fell asleep. And that's where Jesus offered his prayer. And that's why, why Judas would have known the location, because he knew where they were staying that night. And he was easily able to lead the arresting party to that location. And I said, we don't know that for sure, but I think that that makes a very compelling uh, reason why they would have retired there. Uh, and that's especially the case in light of other ancient Jewish sources. So for example, there's other sources from this time in early Judaism that describe the need to sleep within the city limits of Jerusalem during the night of the Passover. So up until now, the whole week uh, that the Jesus and the disciples were in the area, uh, they seem to have been staying over in Bethany, a village on the Just east the slope hill, of the Mount of Olives. Uh, but we know from these other Jewish sources that for the night of the Passover, the municipal boundaries of Jerusalem were considered, considered to extend as far east as the ridge of the Mount of Olives, which means a site like Bethany would be outside that halakhic or that legal boundary in which they needed to sleep. And so the fact that the Gethsemane Grotto is on the west slope of the Mount of Olives means that the Gethsemane Grotto would have been within that larger pilgrimage boundary, uh, that extended municipal boundary of the city uh, in which pilgrims could have spent the night. So I think there's several reasons, both contextually and uh, geographically, topographically, archaeologically and now even halakhically or legalistically, why uh, they might have spent the night in a site like that Gethsemane Grotto. And then you mentioned also one other implication, ritual purity and agricultural production. What else do you want to mention about that? Yeah, so I think in addition to really important implications for our reading of the New Testament story, I think that there's other implications that this archaeological site has for broader discussions within the history of early Judaism and with the archaeology of Roman Palestine, and that includes the idea of ritual purity. Uh, as we mentioned before, this subterranean water feature that Corbo discovered that he thought was a cistern, uh, I think is more accurately understood as a ritual bath or a, uh, a mikvah. 
And that being the case, uh, as I said earlier, we now uh, can refine our understanding of how such facilities would have operated, especially so close to the Temple Mount. Uh, We've already mentioned before that other scholarship has shown that agricultural workers at a site like this would have needed to be in a state of ritual purity to produce the olive oil. And that's particularly because of, well, really two reasons. Number one is no matter where you were producing this olive oil, no matter where in the country of Judea or Galilee, at least a tenth of it would have been tithed, meaning it would have gone to the temple or to the priests at the temple. And so Jewish law by this period had required that all agricultural produce, including wine and olive oil, even part of which was going to the temple, needed to be produced in a state of ritual purity because it was consecrated, set-apart produce that would be be filled into the uh, the temple economy. And so so I think for that reason alone, this mikvah discovered at the Gethsemane Grotto is a really significant reminder of the need for ritual purity in agricultural production around the time of Jesus. But the other uh, reason why I think that's really an interesting feature is because when it was not the fall, meaning when the oil production facilities were dormant and pilgrims were using sites like this to uh, to lodge in, to sleep in on their way to the temple, that ritual bath, that mikvah, would have also allowed them to become ritually purified in their pilgrimage experience. And so we can easily imagine Jesus and the disciples who were Torah-observant Jews, uh, we can easily imagine them using a ritual bath like this to immerse themselves before going to the temple uh, during their stay in the city while they were visiting the temple on pilgrimage. So I think uh, in addition to New Testament readings, I think that there's a lot of really important implications for uh, larger issues within early Judaism and the archaeology of Roman Palestine, namely conversations of ritual purity, agricultural production, and the pilgrimage experience. If you're interested in reading Professor Gray's article called Olive Processing and Ritual Purity in the Place of the Olive Press, an archaeological reconstruction of Jerusalem's first century Gethsemane Grotto, we've provided a link to it on our website at whyreligion.byu.edu. There, you can also learn more about Professor Matthew Gray. And if you've enjoyed Dr. Gray's insights on this episode, I'd also recommend that you go back and listen to his prior episode that he did with Why Religion, episode number 33, titled Mosaics of Faith, where he talks about his research on the Hukok Synagogue and the mosaics around the Sea of Galilee. Okay, we've come to our last segment. As we conclude this episode, we typically get a little more personal with the professor. So here in part three, Professor Gray talks about ways that he approaches scripture study and provides suggestions for us to enhance our experience with the scriptures, particularly if we feel like we've been stuck in a little bit of a rut. In this last segment, we'd like to talk a little bit more about you and and about your journey and, and get some perspective about your experience. Obviously, we've had an opportunity to visit with you in the past, and you told us part of your story and your training and how you ended up here at BYU. Uh, I want to go back and just maybe remind our listeners um, of of some of your training and then then ask um, one more question of you today. So you received a bachelor's degree in Near Eastern Studies from BYU, a master's degree in archaeology and the history of antiquity from Andrews University, uh, and then another master's degree in Jewish Studies from Oxford, and your PhD in archaeology and the history of ancient Judaism from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Um, so with that, and, and maybe against that backdrop, many of our listeners love the Scriptures, but may find themselves plateauing a little bit in their personal uh, studies of Scripture. What have you learned in your graduate studies? Obviously, you've been a, a teacher of Scripture for several years, or in your own personal studies that you think might help uh, enhance our listeners' experience with Scripture? Yeah, that's a great question. It's it's one that we all continue to wrestle with, so it's not that any of us arrive to this point where we're just constantly you know, learning and growing in exciting ways. The, the experience of plateauing in our Scripture study and in our engagement with Scripture I think it's fairly fairly common. We all experience that. So the question is a good one. How do we get off the plateau and continue back on the process of, of exciting scriptural engagement? I think understanding that process of plateauing uh, is, is a, an important first step because by definition, if we're plateauing, that probably means we're not learning much new, right? We, we're probably in a rut. We're probably in a routine of going through the same process. We're reading the same scriptures. We're rereading them, kind of asking the same questions of maybe personal application that we've asked a hundred times. And it's very easy in that 
rut or in that routine uh, to just feel stuck and feel like you're not really learning much. By definition, progression means I'm learning something today that I did not know yesterday. And so one of the best ways, I think, to get off of a plateau in our scripture study or in our spiritual life generally is to get back to the process of learning new and exciting things, of considering fresh perspectives, uh, additional insights, things that we did not know before. And there's something about that process of learning new things and growing in our knowledge of a topic or a scriptural text that uh, kind of re-sparks the spiritual experience. I think for, for a lot of people. And I think that often those fresh insights and those additional perspectives can come through a meaningful engagement with scriptural scholarship, right? Uh, I think in the last conversation we had a, a year ago, we had talked about the process of being disciple scholars of approaching uh, scripture from the lens of faith, but also the lens of scholarship. And I think that for most Latter-day Saints, I think we naturally gravitate towards approaching scripture with faith, uh, and testimony and belief and uh, interest in spiritual application, which is very important, it's extremely powerful. Uh, but sometimes we need a little bit more encouragement, maybe a little more direction in how to approach this by study. And it, with with that in mind, I think that biblical scholarship, especially talking about the Bible, but this would apply to any book of scripture, uh, that biblical scholarship uh, can be better utilized as part of our exciting progress in that process of becoming disciple scholars, those who are all in on their faith, but who are also all in on the life of the mind. And so in terms of scripture study or biblical studies in particular, I actually think that some of uh, our senior church leaders uh, have given us some great examples and uh, suggestions on how to proceed. And these are examples that I found very meaningful in my life. Uh, so for instance, a few months ago, uh, the Desert News uh, was interviewing Elder Jeffrey R. Holland of the Quorum of the Twelve, and they asked him a similar question. You know, tell us about your scripture study. What do you find most engaging, most exciting? And out of the things that Elder Holland listed, one of the uh, most prominent things that he mentioned was getting a good study Bible. Uh, he talked about how uh, how he takes full advantage of. I, th- I think he mentioned the Oxford Study Bible that he he likes to 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 use and to read and to consult because it offers not only fresh perspectives in a new accessible English translation, but it offers introductory essays and footnotes, things that walk the reader through historical commentary and connections that might not be intuitively obvious to modern readers, but that with a little bit of academic perspective and a little bit of scholarly background uh, can really bring the text to life in a way that's exciting, that's new, that's fresh, that's more relevant and more meaningful. And even though that getting a study Bible uh, sounds like it's homework, it sounds like it's more of an (laughs) academic pursuit that maybe we don't intuitively gravitate towards, uh, my experience is that it actually greatly enhances the spiritual experience precisely because of the issue of it's getting you off the plateau. You're learning new things, you're learning new connections, new perspectives, and that is always a valuable thing uh, as we approach Scripture as disciple scholars. So I love Elder Holland's suggestion about getting a good study Bible. A similar suggestion was recently made a few years ago by um, uh, by Elder Ballard of the Quorum of the Twelve, who talked about the need for consulting uh, trained experts, right? So again, kind of endorsing the pursuit of biblical scholarship in this case, right? The idea of look for commentaries, look for podcasts, look for those resources where trained experts who have really great backgrounds in the topics that you're studying can offer their perspectives, can offer the work that they've done, can offer the insights that they've gained through years of study. And I loved how Elder Ballard said that even as a member of the 12 apostles, uh, he still relies heavily on those academic resources precisely because they can inform his faith as a reader of scripture. So I'd say, you know, between getting a good study Bible and consulting the best resources by trained scholars, uh, offering their commentaries and different perspectives, which, by the way, I I think it's important to note that that does not need to be only from a Latter-day Saint perspective. I think that we are greatly enhanced and greatly uh, uh, enriched by consulting the perspectives of other faith communities as well. Our our Catholic uh, friends have produced wonderful scholarship, uh, Protestant scholarship, Jewish scholarship, scholarship from those of no faith tradition, all of which can be extremely beneficial as we seek to gain new insights and new perspectives that will get us off of that plateau and uh, and moving towards uh, progress again. Uh, and again, I think that one of the reasons why so many of these resources are so important is because as modern readers, there's so much about the original context of ancient scripture that is just not intuitively obvious. Uh, and so if we're looking for these new insights and these new perspectives, sometimes it's that ancient context that makes all the difference. I always talk to my students about how context matters. And you know, when we read something out of context, uh, you know, we can certainly find meaning and application there. But when we read scripture in its original context, its historical setting, we see what it meant to these authors and these original audiences in their time and place. And then we look for personal meaning. I just feel like the application process is so much more powerful and profound and enriched. So context matters. 
And then finally, uh, I don't know if we want to go full Joseph Smith here, but uh, for those who are interested in that, uh, we can remember that Joseph Smith uh, himself said that one of the best ways to study scripture is by spending time to get to know the original languages of scripture. I've always been very inspired by the fact that uh, that Joseph Smith, this, this prophetic visionary uh, revelator of the early 19th century, uh, in all of his prophetic work, still took time to hire a Jewish scholar to come teach him Hebrew verbs and Hebrew vocabulary and Hebrew grammar, because it was that academic process of learning the original language of the Hebrew Bible in that case, or or the Greek New Testament in other cases, uh, that actually supplemented and enhanced his own prophetic experience with Scripture. And I think that's a really helpful reminder that in addition to getting a good study Bible, consulting great academic resources, that learning the languages themselves can be an exciting way to continue to find new meaning in Scripture study. And I recognize that that's a little intimidating. I recognize that most people don't feel like they can take the time to go to a university to, to learn Hebrew or to learn Greek. And, and I certainly understand that, although I will say that we are living in a uniquely fascinating time where so many resources are available online to do online courses or even short videos to introduce you to the basics of Hebrew grammar or Greek vocabulary as it relates to the Old and New Testaments. And so I think there's so many resources available to us and that all of these resources allow us to to get off of that plateau, to continue to prog- progress and learning new and exciting things, to keep scripture study fresh, and to keep facilitating that journey of disciple scholarship uh, that we're all seeking. Thank you for listening to Why Religion. This podcast is a production of religious education at Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah. My name is Anthony Sweat, the host and producer. The Why Religion podcast team also includes from BYU Religious Education, professors Brad Wilcox, Casey Griffiths, Ryan Sharp, and Hank Smith. Recording, mixing, and original music was done by BYU student Mitchell Bashford. Say hi, Mitchell. Hi, guys. Original music and scoring for Why Religion podcast was also created by the fabulous BYU student musicians Grant Cagle, Sam Clausen, Colette Jones, and Alistair Scheuermann. If you enjoy what you've heard, please like and subscribe to Why Religion on wherever you get your podcasts and leave us a rating. It really helps. And join us next time as we continue to bring the everyday Latter-day Saint fascinating gospel studies done by Brigham Young University religion professors to enlighten your mind and strengthen your faith.